let's kick this next installment of Yashar University's Industrial Engineering Seminar Series. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Engin Topan from University of Twente. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from Middle East Technical University, and then worked as a researcher and instructor at Chanka University, Turkish Military Academy, Eindhoven University of Technology in Netherlands, and he's been working as I understand from uh, starting from 2016 at the University of Twente since then. He especially uh, works on research projects on proactive after sales service logistics for capital goods, proactive maintaining planning, and he also works on uh, predicting planning and scheduling for service control towers. Today, his talk is titled Operational Spare Parts Planning in Service Control Towers, very much in line with his research topics. We're looking forward to learn more about that. In Inojem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mahmoud uh, Then I will share my uh, screen, but uh, host disabled participant screen sharing, maybe I should be allowed. I'm sorry, let me try this again. I mm -hmm. think I did it, it's just, um, okay. Um, so your panelists, now try that again. Oh, now I, can, now okay. I can do it. Thank you. Share. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Then uh, I can start, uh, I think. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mahmoud Hocam, uh, Levent Hocam, uh, the other, uh, all the other uh, Hocalars. Uh, I'm happy to be here to present uh, my work. Uh, so also thank you for inviting me for your uh, talk, for this talk. Uh, I, I, I sometimes visit uh, actually Yashar University, so I already have uh, the feeling that I have ties with uh, Yashar University, not only with uh, Levant Hoca, but some other colleagues as well. So today the topic will be, uh, my topic will be about uh, what I have been working on the last uh, four or five years in the uh, University of Trente. Uh, which is about uh, spare parts, uh, which is uh, also my uh, PhD thesis about. But uh, now if the focus is a little bit different uh, from uh, those who are familiar with spare parts, uh, like uh, Önder Hoca. Uh, this is more about operational uh, planning and it's about service control towers. And, uh, uh, but first of all, I would like to introduce a little bit about myself. I'm uh, origin from Bodrum and studied in Izmir and then uh, in Ankara in Middle East Technical University. And uh, uh, those were uh, two people who were uh, supervising me. So you, some of you already know them, uh, Pelin Bayinder and Tarkantan. And I then worked, uh, meanwhile, uh, at Chanka University and Military Academy. So uh, those are some pictures from uh, Chanka University. I'm holding, uh, I mean, the graduation summary uh, ceremony. And uh, back then, uh, we worked together with uh, Levant Hoca, who is a kind of a model for me. Uh, as a teacher, I must say, as I took uh, many courses from him. And uh, this is also my military school, uh, military academy uh, past. Uh, and I think uh, one of my komuta, uh, com uh, comrade is also uh, uh, participating in the uh, uh, Yashar University, I guess, Yavuz uh, I'm married with Ipek and we have a daughter, Ekin. So these are a little bit earlier pictures. So Ekin is much uh, older now. And my work experience, I worked at Eindhoven. So Oktay uh, was also there uh, when I was, I, I left, I think almost uh, a little bit, something like that. Uh, there I worked with uh, Hertian van Houten on a project uh, on advanced event information uh, on uh, tactical planning of spare parts. And later on, I joined uh, the current group first as a postdoc, then as an assistant professor. Uh, I'm giving some courses on uh, mostly application of uh, stochastic models, uh, let's say. And uh, after this is my main focus. So today I'm going to talk about Procello, Procello Next and Opcenter projects, which I'm uh, contributing, uh, I have been and I'm still contributing. But I also have interest in offshore maintenance. And uh, recently I'm working also on main, uh, predictive maintenance and smart industry topics. Uh, uh, but uh, the main idea is uh, how we can uh, model uncertainty and how can we uh, reduce uncertainty by using information in all those uh, fields. So uh, I will talk about two papers today. Uh, those are the two papers that are outcome of my uh, postdoc research. Uh, one is, uh, uh, is this review paper. 
Uh, in the 3D paper, we look at service control towers because uh, we have some companies and they are building service control towers and we try to understand what is this service control tower is about and uh, what do we have in the literature. Uh, that was the main idea of the review paper. Um, and if you think about, if you uh, look for an answer about what is service control tower, you can imagine the guy here in front of the computer looking at different uh, uh, decision support system and trying to make decisions. That's more or less what the control tower at the moment uh, is trying to do in the companies. Uh, but what does it bring? Actually, it brings uh, visibility and uh, it brings uh, also creates alerts based on the data available, real-time data available, and uh, provides the decision support. And if possible, in later in the future, perhaps, an autonomous system that can take some of the decision uh, by the control tower. Uh, so basically, the comp uh, control tower is a system that uses real-time data and integrates processes in the supply chain. It's a very uh, common topic, a common terminology in supply chain, by the way. Uh, but now I'm focusing on after-sales supply chain. With uh, the therefore, the term is service control tower. Um, and uh, companies use uh, the data, real-time data, uh, in their supply system, as well as demand side, uh, to generate exception messages when they see some deviation between the, their technical plans and operational, uh, what goes in the operational level. And uh, then uh, they review these exceptions and uh, take the uh, operational interventions. Um, Usually, when we talk about service control towers, there is also the information structure, information uh, levels and uh, layers uh, in, the, in, the, in the whole process. So if you look at from that perspective, we see five layers, or people see five layers. And uh, we are focusing on the two layers, which are called data application layer, where we look at the data and uh, generate trends and alerts which can be fed into decision support system. So we are at more in the data application and operation layer. Of course, the other layers are also important, how to store the data, how to perceive the data, as well as the physical uh, supply chain. Um, and actually, all these decisions, uh, the, the um, uh, research that we are doing is very much depend on the other layers, of course. Um, so what is... Um, what is operational planning? So uh, with, the, with the service control towers, we the companies are usually using these service control towers to address their operational problems rather than tactical planning. So they are very happy with their ERP systems and those kind of things. And they are and also very uh, nice uh, tactical um, planning tools are available already with uh, those companies. But when it comes to operation level, they need those uh, monitoring systems, control towers. And what is different in operation planning then? First of all, the first striking difference is we are looking at immediate effects, not long-term effects, but immediate effects, like hours, days, at most weeks. So uh, we want to find solutions with, uh, in, in, with at least uh, at most in a couple of weeks uh, uh, term, let's say. In that sense, we are short-sighted and somebody should take care of what decisions we are taking at a tactical level still, uh, but we are, with this operation planning, we are doing firefighting, uh, basically. And uh, interventions, therefore, are usually short, uh, interventions that has shorter lead time than regular replenishments. Um, and information uh, is real time, not only inventory on hand, but we also look at what the pipeline stock is, where the stock uh, spare part in the uh, supply network, and also we look at uh, what is the situation or condition of the repair process and what is the expected completion time. These are also, of course, demand information possible if there is some kind of predictive maintenance uh, condition monitoring data available. All these type of real-time information is of interest uh, to solve the problems. And of course, uh, strategic and tactical planning is also important, but these are fixed. We cannot change within a week. Uh, those, you cannot change your supply chain just in one or two weeks. That's why we know that uh, those decisions, strategic and technical planning are, decisions are fixed. So this is just an example from um, another company who is uh, uh, seeing similar layers and uh, trying to input the tactical planning constraints into their uh, decisions. And uh, also considering that there are multiple objectives like maximizing mutualization, minimizing uh, a working process or repair process. This is for the repair shop uh, in this specific example. And they maximize uh, service levels uh, by considering different uh, levels of information. 
Uh, so looking at companies and their uh, ongoing uh, works, uh, we uh, try to develop a, a framework uh, for uh, the problems uh, or uh, the uh, uh, tools that are available or the um, decision supports that are available. Uh, we see like, uh, as you see here, um, there is information update process. This can be tactical or operational, forecasting as well, inventory as well. We are focusing on operational level. So for example, for forecasting, this means we are not interested in um, uh, seasonal uh, fluctuations or long-term trends, but we are rather looking at uh, very real-time information to generate alerts. So in that sense, the way we are looking at forecast is different. Similarly, for inventory control, we are not interested in uh, what should be the optimal inventory levels in the system, in the supply chain, but rather how we can deploy, how we can reallocate in the system. Um, that uh, therefore uh, makes uh, the uh, analysis uh, quite different from uh, technical planning, which the whole literature, most of the literature is about, uh, actually. Uh, so what kind of interventions are we talking about? We are talking about uh, when uh, something happens, how to fulfill the demand from which location. And also, also it could be proactive, like, okay, how can we redistribute uh, the stocks in the network uh, to reduce uh, possible uh, downtimes? which is the uh, critical uh, measure in uh, space parts. And, uh, and the controlling level, the inventory level, is a tactical problem. And these kind of things are, are outside our scope because they are fixed and we cannot influence. But they have impact on our decisions. Uh, we made uh, company surveys. We uh, look at five companies uh, uh, in, the, in the project, and uh, those companies are uh, producing uh, some capital goods. So capital goods are some kind of advanced uh, technical systems that does a certain function or gives a certain uh, service. So for example, it can be a baggage handling system, as you see here. Uh, a baggage handling system. I think in Ankara airport, uh, uh, this uh, company has uh, using, we are using uh, in Ankara the uh, uh, that's, um, uh, baggage handling system. I don't know whether Istanbul and Izmir are also doing, but um, it, it, these are market leaders uh, basically in their uh, markets. And uh, this can be a radar system, this can be a, a lithography, photolithography system that produces uh, chips. It can be an airplane and uh, it can be a, a large printing system. Uh, and those five companies are in this, uh, uh, in these, we are seeing the pictures of those companies. It is their assets. And those assets need papers, basically. And if you look at uh, the companies, uh, we see they have a, a usually a rather complicated network with two to four echelons. So, for example, this is one of the companies and uh, they are just the network in the uh, in Germany, it's uh, quite already a uh, 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 complex one with two echelons. So in the global network, it becomes three, even four. Um, and we are talking about very slow moving uh, items. So even in a global network, uh, the number of uh, uh, the demand size is uh, less than a, less than five, for example, per year. So we are really talking about very slow moving items. It's not like retailing. And these are very expensive also. So on the average, more than 1,000 euros. For example, I know one part, which is 1 million euros. So it's rather a big system uh, in the very specific uh, uh, an example, let's say. And uh, what was also striking from those surveys are, uh, if we ask people who are the planners uh, on spare parts, uh, they say that they spent 4 to 90% of their time on operation planning. So that's an important measure for uh, indicator for us because we know most literature is about tactical planning. So what should be the optimal inventory levels in the network and these kind of things. Uh, but actually what they are dealing with was on operational planning. This could also be because maybe tactical planning is very strong and therefore now the remaining jobs or works, uh, research to be done should be on operation planning. And I think that gives us the feeling uh, that evidence that I think these are the problems really that uh, people should address. And with this survey, we try to indicate those interesting uh, ones. Uh, so what are the interventions? So if there's a fire or there is downtime, how can the uh, uh, downtime can be reduced by uh, finding the uh, spare parts in the closest place? 
And if we look at the possible interventions, it can be an emergency equipment from a, a central warehouse. It can be expediting a repair in the repair process and, or even a new buy. And sometimes, although uh, those uh, downtime costs are very high, um, back ordering could also sometimes be an option because maybe there is a part on the pipeline and it's going to come tomorrow. So why should we bother with uh, an emergency shipment and just wait for the part that will come to that uh, location uh, that needs the part, let's say. So we see that uh, that's also very often used by the companies as an intervention, not to intervene. It's also an option, actually, though the downtime costs are uh, really high. And what was also striking and maybe also uh, uh, could be interesting uh, uh, for uh, Önder Hoca, uh, customer differentiation is very much uh, interesting at the, at, uh, at, the, at, the, at the literature, right? in the literature, right? Especially at the tactical level. Also companies do uh, use, uh, differentiate their uh, uh, spare pass service uh, with different service contracts. But when it comes to operation level, they don't differentiate. So they say that, okay, I cannot tell my customer that I don't have part while I have part in my stock. So they can, they don't uh, differentiate it. That was very surprising for us because you differentiate that at the tactical level. Why don't you do that at the operation level? So seeing that was also interesting. It's also because they don't know how to differentiate that actually. Uh, they don't uh, really know what to do in those cases and how you, they can allocate certain service targets at the tactical level, at the operation level. These are also open directions, uh, maybe also for Önder Ojan. I know that uh, he has uh, a paper on uh, that subject. Uh, and uh, we investigated 50 papers because there were 50 papers that are close to that, um, close to these topics. And uh, we, one of the open points, as I already mentioned in the previous uh, slide, um, there are fixed time, windows, uh, there, there could be fixed time windows, there should be fixed time windows with uh, fixed uh, service levels. Because if we have some service agreements with the customers, if the companies have certain uh, customer uh, agreements with the customers, it should somehow boil down to certain targets over fixed times. That's not available at the companies yet. They know this is interesting, but there are not tools or models uh, that does this. That's why one of the findings uh, about the open research direction is how to incorporate real-time service performance into uh, short-time packages and how, how can we do real-time customer differentiation for the uh, customers. And maybe also use system approach. So system approach is about uh, we want to keep more items for uh, cheaper ones than uh, compared to uh, expensive ones. You can do that because at the end of the day, customer is interested in the uptime of the system. So whether you keep uh, you keep this uptime level with a cheap, keeping cheap part or expensive part doesn't make difference. That's very much known at the tactical level, but nothing is done at the operational level. So maybe system approach could also have some implications on operational level. Uh, so those were the uh, certain findings and other things were like, okay, how we can combine periodic reviews and continuous review because these are also uh, used and how can we determine certain thresholds that will generate uh, alerts and how to handle alerts. And uh, those exception messages are also important because companies have some alert systems. Uh, they are not that effective. Uh, usually they create too many alerts and they can only handle some of them. And that's also uh, something about, okay, how can we prioritize, uh, how can we generate alerts first of all? Uh, we should be smart enough not to generate too much alerts plus, once we generate it, we need to prioritize them uh, to better allocate the resources. And here is an example of uh, the, some of the steps of uh, uh, alert generation steps uh, that we have seen. So it requires some kind of machine learning techniques as well, as well to classify what is an alert situation, what is not an alert situation. Once we do that, then we need to also evaluate at the tech system level uh, by looking at the cost, let's say. And that brings us to uh, these uh, false uh, alarms, uh, uh, false positives, false negatives. Uh, so those should also be incorporated in the decision making. And that's why a uh, possible uh, also feature research is how to incorporate imperfect information uh, which is coming from predictions to uh, in the operational planning is also uh, uh, an interesting 
uh, research area uh, as we find out and uh, how to also incorporate supply information so if you are doing repair so where we are at the repair process are we at the very early return from the operator phase or are we at the final inspection i think this kind of information is also very valid to estimate the uh, predicted uh, uh, repair time and to predict the repair time and that can be very much used in the uh, firefighting and uh, you can imagine that a lot of machine learning uh, uh, algorithms can help us with this uh, uh, approach. So basically, we are not using really uh, real uh, long-term uh, forecasts. Uh, we rather use machine learning type of uh, prediction models to predict a very near future. And, um, and of course, at the end, we need still a unified and holistic approach to take into account those predictions and then take make the uh, right interventions by considering that there are many interventions. And that we need uh, uh, efficient algorithms, and we need to also uh, efficient algorithms for uh, predictions, and also find the best solutions for the interventions. That was the review paper. Um, uh, we later uh, picked one of those topics and worked on uh, one of them. Uh, it's uh, again together with my colleague from uh, 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 Twente, Maciej van der Heiden. And um, in that uh, case, we look at the photolithographic system. So photolithography system is a system that produces chips. So very important, especially for the uh, chip crisis. Uh, you can imagine that uh, this company, um, probably some of you know, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for, for example, I, I'm sure Optai already knows. Um, uh, the, the, these companies um, uh, very important uh, for the whole uh, supply of chips, which is critical in a whole supply chain. And uh, downtime is very expensive. Therefore, they keep a very uh, uh, sophisticated, let's say, uh, so global supply chain network. They are also using very advanced tactical planning tools. I can confirm that uh, one of those tactical planning uh, models is based on a, a PhD thesis uh, from Eindhoven. And that PhD thesis is also rewarded as the best thesis in one of the Euro conferences. So you can imagine that very sophisticated models are available from the universities, and those companies are actually using this. And I sometimes even surprised with to discuss with the people there. For example, I was asking about okay, how can I find the downtime? And the guy was saying that okay, you can find it from the Lagrangian multiplier. So those kind of things can even be possible with, to talk with those guys. Let's say, because they are also uh, graduated from similar universities by taking similar courses on those topics. But uh, when it comes to operational level, things are not that uh, brilliant, let's say, and uh, smart enough. And of course, stockouts always occur because you are planning stockouts also uh, because of the cost consequences by looking at trade offs. But now the question what to do with the stockouts, uh, how to reduce the downtime? Uh, when some uh, failure occurs, or how can I avoid it before something happens? So we have seen both, we are considering in this paper, both proactive and reactive approaches. Um, at the operational level, uh, as I said, we so use two things. One, reactive solutions. Reactive solutions means there is a demand, there is a stock out, the nearby local warehouse does not have the stock. Now the question, how can we fulfill? Should it should it fulfill from the nearby local warehouse or from the central warehouse or just wait for the record <clears throat> um, pipeline stock? So we could also wait for the pipeline stock if it is very near uh, to be delivered. If the delivery time is closer. Also, we should also deal with like, okay, uh, there's nothing happened yet, but uh, I need uh, to better utilize the current resources in the spare parts in the uh, network. So how can I use proactive interventions uh, by reallocating things to reduce risks? It's also of interest. And we consider both in, in this paper. Um, in, in, in this uh, uh, OEM, uh, we consider the two echelon inventory system because they have one central warehouse and multiple local warehouses that, uh, the, uh, and with multiple spare parts. So it's a rather uh, a large uh, network, I must say, with multiple uh, warehouses and multiple stock, uh, spare parts, items. 
we focus on short term. Uh, decisions are made daily uh, or at short notice. Sometimes there can be a failure and we run the model again. Uh, that's also possible. And uh, we assume we should know that tactical decisions are fixed. For example, total number of uh, stocks in the system, in the whole supply chain, cannot be changed. Uh, if your interest in two weeks, you cannot change this number. You know that uh, lead times are much longer. And therefore, base stock levels and the total stock is fixed. And we use real-time information, like pipeline information, delivery times. And decisions depend on the system state. So if we are familiar from this uh, stochastic models, all those uh, long-term decisions, long-term um, analysis, like uh, steady state analysis cannot be used at this moment. We are looking at a transient behavior rather than a steady state. Um, and uh, demand is stochastic, of course, uh, still. And uh, central warehouse uh, replenishes stocks. Uh, of the local warehouses. Uh, so the, the only role of central warehouse is to uh, replenish stocks. And we consider a kind of echelon stock, which means we are just looking, central warehouse is responsible for the total number of uh, stocks in the whole supply chain. And their base stock levels are defined based on that definition. And local warehouses uh, also operate to fulfill the demand of the uh, customers, which are close uh, to the uh, customers those uh, warehouses, sometimes in the location of the uh, customer facility. And we propose an MIP model. So, uh, so um, Jam might uh, be uh, surprised with that. I was talking about stochastic model, but we end up with a, a kind of almost uh, a deterministic model, not fully deterministic, but at least we can formulate this as an MIP model. We determine the optimal timing and size of the shipment type. As well as we minimize, uh, we try to, our objective is to minimize the uh, downtime uh, cost as well as shipment cost. Uh, shipment is also important, so nothing is free. Shipment also has a cost, especially if you do an emergency shipment. Uh, sometimes they even use a taxi, I heard, for example, uh, to send the spare part. Yeah, taxi is not a big price maybe, but uh, you can sometimes need to also uh, flight uh, to the delivery part. And uh, multi-item to echelon general demand with positive lead time is the setting that we consider. And we use a rolling horizon procedure, uh, which means decisions are made for a fixed horizon uh, for one month or two weeks, let's say, uh, which is definitely smaller than the supply lead time of the whole system. Therefore, you cannot change the total demand, uh, total spare parts in the system. And decisions are uh, made for initial period only. Uh, that is the idea of the rolling horizon. We just pick the decisions in the initial period and we just ignore the rest. But this is repeated every period. Um, and we are inspired by uh, the practice. Uh, we consider two things. Uh, some reviews in the system was taken periodically. Sometimes they are done, not sometimes, but this, they also use opportunistic reviews. So what is an opportunistic review? Uh, you can also make reallocation in the system when a stock out occurs. And you can do that, you can use this time as an opportunity to rethink about uh, interventions, proactive interventions, as well as solving the reactive problem that you should do there, you should solve it there. Uh, and next to that, we also consider periodic reviews, uh, which means uh, just an, another opportunity to do proactive interventions, but also clear back orders. So we, we make an assumption here by back order clearing that it is taken only at the beginning of the period. But these are one day, so it's a very short uh, period. Um, we use the same model uh, to solve the both uh, type of, for both periodic and the opportunistic reviews. Uh, and we run in a rolling horizon procedure, uh, as I mentioned. And, um, and we only implement the decision in the first uh, initial periods. So we mentioned that we are interested in multiple interventions. So these are the six interventions that we have seen. I already mentioned that we differentiate uh, interventions as proactive and reactive. And among the, and I should remember that uh, those interventions uh, is defi are defined all for number uh, items, local warehouses, and also number of periods. So you can imagine that this is a really large uh, MIP in terms of size, but not constraints, by the way. We don't have that much of constraints still. We will come to that. And um, what are the things we can use? A regular replenishment still, right? Although it's a more tactical level uh, thing, we can. We are still dependent on uh, how regular replenishments are going, but still a decision variable. Correct replenishments uh, from the lateral 
from local warehouse is also possible. So all those uh, and uh, correct emergency from the central warehouse. What makes these proactive? They occur before a stock out occurs. And there are also interventions that happen after uh, a stock out occurs. These are again reactive emergency shipments and emergency shipments from central warehouse or from uh, a letter, letter from a local warehouse. Or we could also use wait for the pipeline uh, and then um, place an emergency shipment. Um, before each part, so um, if you look at uh, uh, the input parameters, so as I already mentioned, base stock level is fixed. Uh, the total base stock level for the uh, in the in the system is fixed, uh, and uh, lead times are also fixed. And we also have inputs as a shipment cost and also downtime cost. So, uh, but we don't have a unit holding cost. So I will come to that point, and also we have a replenishment lead time for the central warehouse. Uh, our formulation of the model is a little bit similar to uh, how we can also uh, uh, define use uh, in some production planning uh, uh, models. Uh, we look at the cumulative inventory and cumulative demand, and we subtract them. And in that way, we calculate the, so the cumulative inventory and the cumulative demand are uh, the measures that the, the, the two key uh, uh, par par uh, variables that we look at, and their difference will tell us whether we keep inventory or back order. So it's a little bit similar to also uh, we see in production scheduling. Sometimes we can also uh, define inventories as a difference between the uh, total production minus the total uh, demand. Uh, um, yeah, and that's uh, what uh, we do here. And uh, what are the decision variables? Uh, decision variables are uh, all kinds of shipments in the uh, system, as I mentioned. And we already say that uh, the uh, inventory, uh, the, the base stock levels are fixed. So I just want to continue with the objective function. Uh, in this objective function, for example, here we see the, how we calculate the inventory or the order costs. And we have also shipment costs, but in our model, we don't have an inventory holding cost because the inventory is fixed. So we have an inventory, mo inventory uh, uh, model without any inventory holding cost because in total inventory is fixed in the system. We cannot influence that. We can just change the location and uh, location wise, uh, we don't assume differences in terms of uh, holding costs. And uh, total shipments uh, cannot exceed what is available. In the, in the central warehouse uh, is one constraint. Another constraint is we should uh, still write uh, cumulative inventory in the system uh, based on our decisions. And that's uh, the constraint that we should include because it's a uh, model with uh, tea time periods. And um, inventory positions um, uh, cannot exceed the target base stock level. We, that was also a kind of agreement that we already made at the beginning, that uh, we should always take into account that uh, tactical planning is imposes some constraint, especially for the base stock levels. That's the constraint now here. Whatever I do, I don't uh, let the system uh, exceed uh, the uh, base stock levels that we agreed at the tactical level. And finally, uh, I did not introduce, but since we can use this model for both uh, reactive and uh, proactive purpose, when this D is positive, this means there is a demand. There is a kind of stock out uh, that uh, should be considered. And uh, therefore, first thing that we should do is uh, we should make sure that these are satisfied and, uh, and meet the back orders. That's also something that uh, we also incorporate. And uh, this MIP is decomposable There's because no constraint decomposable by parts because there is no constraint that links the parts. And we did uh, numerical examples with 6,000 parts and 30 local warehouse. Now I continue with the numerical study. And um, if I look at that, we see that uh, we also select, uh, we try, try to select items as high, low, high demand, low demand, high, high cost, high, uh, low cost, because we see a lot of as asymmetry in the data. So don't think that these are, so this Pareto rule, works here very much. And actually the rule is like 93% of the uh, items. Um, so 7% of the items explains 90% of the uh, total price. So we should also incorporate that. And uh, therefore we look at, we classify four different groups, high low demands and high low cost. 
And therefore, our results also uh, uh, change depending on these uh, classes. That's why we make this uh, uh, four groups. Uh, most uh, striking results is we can reduce the downtime substantially, 30% by using uh, the model. And another important thing is most of the benefit is coming from uh, potential reduction is coming from proactive interventions, proactive emergency shipments. This might be surprising to you because you might expect that reactive shipments also brings. For reactive, the problem is very trivial. Uh, you should just find the closest part in the uh, system and uh, fulfill the demand because uh, downtime is very expensive. Uh, therefore, uh, usually uh, reactive uh, decisions, interventions are rather trivial, but proactive is not. There you have you don't have that much of pressure of the downtime yet, and therefore uh, it makes quite difference uh, uh, whether you should do the shipment or not, because uh, there is a, a clear trade-off between shipment cost and uh, downtime risks. Uh, but benefit is higher for high demand parts. So all these uh, nice uh, reallocation things and also uh, the, these um, emergency shipments makes more sense for high demand parts. Yeah, I think it's a little bit expected because if there are parts that are, if there is demand is high, then there are parts in stock, right? We keep stock uh, to uh, uh, hedge against uh, demand uncertainty for this high demand. And then there's uh, traffic. And therefore that model makes sense if you have high demand. And uh, another uh, observation was the uh, value of proactive letter transshipments uh, was uh, high, especially for high demand and low uh, price parts. And there is also a good reason for that. As I said, high demand is needed because uh, this model makes sense if there is some traffic, if there are parts in stock and, and you have a part in stock because tactical planning model says, okay, demand is high, then I should increase the spare parts, and once you have spare parts at local warehouses, then there's a traffic, and that makes sense to use such models. And also, this makes more sense also for low price items, because uh, for high price items, uh, tactical planning wants to keep everything at the central warehouse to reduce risks and pull, uh, pull the uh, risks, let's say. Uh, but low price items, there we see more in the downstream. Therefore, there is more transaction tra tra traffic in the downstream. So you see many of our results somewhat related to the tactical planning, and therefore we are very much uh, dependent on tactical planning, uh, as uh, we see that uh, quite many times here. We look at the greedy algorithm, we look at the other heuristics, but they don't perform as we want. Uh, so we are happy with the MIP solution. We were able to solve this uh, problem for 6,030 local warehouses with one central warehouse. And uh, stock outs. It was also very interesting for us to see, okay, do we sometimes wait for the pipeline in the optimal solution? Yes, 8% uh, of the time we see that the model suggests not to react at all and say that, okay, just wait for the pipeline stock. Uh, that would be enough, good or uh, optimal enough to uh, not to, to react against the downtime risk. Um, so what are the future challenges? Uh, uh, so what we see now, we are working on another project uh, called Op Center. In this project, we look look at uh, and now focus on uh, ch future challenges. And what are those future challenges? Now we see already that from us, especially with COVID, demand and supply are very dynamic, and we need uh, to deal with that. And therefore, uh, and also not only parts, spare parts, but also service engineers, tools should also be available at the same time. So actually we are talking about a difficult uh, problem. There's uncertainty and there are multiple uh, resources that should be available. And we see that customers also have different requirements, different needs. Basically we need flexible solutions. I think those features uh, challenges could also be very much uh, expanded to many supply chains. I think many supply chains have similar problems. And at the end, this comes up with flexible solutions. And okay, what are the possible flexible solutions then? 3D printing is definitely one. It can be used uh, for spare parts. Uh, repair capacity, having deploying repair capacity close to facilities. Uh, maybe by using some kind of clothing solutions, uh, that also uh, makes it possible. You can just outsource it, pay for a while uh, when you think that your uh, risks are higher at that location. 
And service engineers can use augmented reality to find out uh, uh, quick solutions. Uh, also use perhaps decision support systems with remote monitoring to help them uh, to find uh, uh, failure quickly. And uh, alert generation and planning scheduling based on alert is uh, all of the companies, what companies are doing, but uh, there are still uh, many challenges there. Uh, so we shouldn't generate too much alerts and our alert should be uh, also uh, somewhat prioritized and put it into the planning and scheduling. And uh, we need machine learning definitely, but maybe also using hybrid models to incorporate expert knowledge. Expert knowledge is very important for spare parts, uh, maintenance and after sales. And maybe also we can use physical models because sometimes these parts are failing according to some physical laws. And Finally, we think uh, people need decision support systems, but that should be also trustable and accepted by the uh, people. So this was my uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, I talked about, I uh, presented first two papers and there were two uh, follow-up papers on this uh, subject. So if you are interested in, uh, you can find uh, them from here. So, uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. Well, thank you very much, Yuring uh, Topan. This was very interesting. We got uh, for the price of one, not one, but more than one researcher. So I think we had a good deal for today. Um, yeah. Definitely very interesting. I'll leave the floor to open to questions, and I'll especially ask. Uh, this is a seminar series. It's also a graduate seminar courses. So there are. Uh, among us, uh, some graduate students who are taking the seminar course uh, as a series, and from them as well, but from every audience, um, mm -hmm. the uh, floor is um, open for questions. I, I do have one that uh, mm -hmm. maybe until people um, can gather their thoughts if uh, there are nothing, I didn't see anything yet. I'm going to go to very uh, um, start of your presentation mm -hmm. and talk about differentiating these customers. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's an interesting thing because you know the, the items that you're uh, talking about, which you mentioned later on, that they are um, operationally quite how do you call it, significant items like you know things about uh, you said luggage dealers or, or, or cheap yeah. manufacturers and and these are things that possibly you know stop the current flow of life as we know it so it is difficult so um it is really difficult to differentiate customers on that level so if you have spare parts and somebody comes to you saying that my communications is down or my airport whatever is down and say eh, i really don't want to sell it to you but sell it to someone else mm -hmm. so i'm guessing in those kind of situations wouldn't it make sense to have a, a long-term maybe supply contract and, and mm -hmm. based on that maybe differentiation is more possible i'm holding you know if I, I don't know if you come across those kind of things that happens in automotive industry for example that mm -hmm. you're, you have these supply contracts and saying that this many i i promise to supply for you this many i promise to hold on mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hold an inventory for you kind of thing yeah i i fully agree uh, mahmoud hocam um, and that's also mainly the reason why companies are not interested or not are, are not using customer differentiation at the operational level. So they don't want to say no a, for a customer request while they already see a part in stock. Yeah. Uh, I fully uh, agree with that. Um, and regarding the tactical level, it's good that you mentioned those contracts, service contracts. There are service contracts really taking care of these uh, things actually. And even the supply chain also differentiate. For example, I mentioned about two, four, two to four echelons, uh, but, at the, but for example, for some customers, they just use only the center layout because uh, they say that, okay, we want to be more affordable. So uh, we are okay with uh, a little bit more downtime, but uh, let's reduce the service contracts. And then they just use the uh, only central warehouse. So basically there are, and also depending on that, uh, there are less inventory cap for that customer um, at, the, at that location, dedicated location. So there is dedicated location. There is sometimes contracts directly with the central warehouse. So it seems like uh, those are negotiable with the customer and there are uh, clear service contracts, but those are not coming down to the operational level. And we think mathematically, according to theory, we think that, if things work at that level, they have some implications to the operation level. And there is already a service contract 
uh, by differentiating because uh, you already agreed with the customer. This could also be put into the um, uh, service contracts. And I think that requires more than just mathematical models. I agree with that. But I see, we see benefits for uh, expanding this uh, at the tactical, strategical level to operational level because uh, there is a differentiation at other levels anyway on service contracts, but there is no consequence. And that's also not fair for the uh, customers who are paying more, actually. Uh, so that, that's why it's a tricky one, but I also see, uh, we also see possible benefits for uh, for a fair, fair allocation still, I must say. Yeah. Um, before I pass the question to Özgür Hocavich, I see his hand, but so you, what you're doing is definitely very interesting. You're taking, uh, based on these tactical level decisions, you know, making the operational thing, which but I think we can also think of this, what you're doing is an input to a um, tactical level service agreements as well. So, you know, what, what happens, you know, because this is the, how best you can do the operation. And based on that, you might want to ne renegotiate or do your next uh, service agreement uh, at the tactical level. Exactly. That's indeed uh, one of the things. Uh, how to integrate tactical and operational planning is uh, one of the most important things. And... Uh, I, I think I just uh, didn't have in that uh, in the I haven't have it in my uh, presentation. But we are working now on how to integrate this tactical and uh, operational planning. I definitely agree with you. That's uh, how it should work. So it's not okay. things are not at the, on the operation level. Tactical level should also be influenced and should revised again based on those decisions that are taken at the operation level. Great, yeah. Jim, uh, you have a question. Well, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I, I would like to start with commenting or contributing on the monetary's question. Uh, what is customer differentiation at a uh, at the tactical level may easily become a customer um, uh, well discrimination actually at the operational level. So uh, they need to be careful in terms of. Uh, difference between differentiation and discrimination mm -hmm. it becomes a sensitive issue maybe that may be the case they may be ignoring uh, yeah. the, this yeah. this kind of decisions at the um, operational level well my question is about the your mixed integer programming model where you mm -hmm. presented on the 25th slide i guess um, mm -hmm. well where, where you said that you ignored the holding cost actually yeah, yeah. so well, so I didn't have a chance to look into the, the details, but uh, in the first, uh, as a first opinion, it didn't quite make sense to ignore the holding cost. If you have back ordering cost, uh, and then you need to be also considering holding cost. That's the, as a you know first impression. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you elaborate on this, please? Özgür uh, there is a uh, very clear reason for that. Uh, if you have uh, the following information, um, the, uh, the total stock in the network is not changing because we are talking about two weeks of period. So even if I place an order now to my cent central warehouse, we cannot influence it. It won't come uh, within two weeks. Therefore, the total number of inventory in the uh, supply chain is fixed. And multiplying this uh, fixed number with uh, another fixed uh, holding cost, we don't differentiate, by the way, holding cost per location. Uh, that's uh, still a limitation because we are talking about global network and how can the holding cost be the same for all locations. Uh, but we are assuming, or we are uh, suggested uh, by the company to assume a fixed uh, holding cost, same holding cost for all uh, locations, not for part, of course. Therefore, the, these are fixed numbers and they won't have uh, effect on the uh, decisions, optimal decisions. That's the main reason, actually. Well, uh, for a certain time window, it, the uh, whole, you know, inventory may be remaining constant, but since you are considering a rolling horizon type, so yeah. wouldn't mm -hmm. that be affecting your uh, stock? Yeah. Like you, you, uh, mm -hmm. rolling window? You are right that uh, this may end up with uh, ordering and ordering and ordering while firefighting, maybe I'm increasing my inventories. That's right. That might be the case. But uh, what we do is here uh, with this base stock policy, 
constraint. We are also putting an upper cap on the number of inventories per location, even saying that, okay, per location, we already agreed at the tactical level that inventory levels cannot exceed the base stock level. Well, that's, not a decision, that's not a decision variable. That's, that's not a decision variable. That's a fixed uh, one. Yeah, this oh, SIJ well, okay. is a fixed uh, capacity constraint. And you may still wonder, okay, who is giving these fixed numbers? Yes, that comes to the same problem. Tactical planning is imposing constraints, and we assume tactical planning is correct, uh, which might not be, of course. Or should this information, this information should be fed back to the tactical level and tactical level should still revise itself. But uh, that, that's the, I, I, we, we also consider these, uh, how, looking at how things are taken into account in practice. So they make the plans at the tactical level and they fix them and then look at the operation level. And we try to incorporate that behavior to the model. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So it's it's indeed a very difficult uh, thing also for us, basically, because many things just evaporate when you look at the short-term period and uh, you need to take some uh, assumptions there by looking at what reality is doing, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there you have a question. Uh, thank you, Joe. Actually, I... I had a question, but uh, Engin Hocam already discussed that part with Özgür Hoca, so I only have a comment, single comment, uh, about the gap between the tactical level planning and operational level actions. So mm -hmm. that part was very interesting. Thank you, Hocam. Uh, because while following your presentation, I was thinking about uh, the importance of uh developing policies or conducting research based on realistic conditions and constraints so that, that part is related with uh, that issue i think uh, for example uh, let's consider your your case where you mentioned the uh, tactical level plans based on customer prioritization but the, the in reality it doesn't work right so that, that, that insight is important because at the tactical level, sometimes we ignore these issues and uh, in order to reduce the system costs, we, we, we propose policies according to, for this example, customer prioritization. Mm -hmm. uh, but this does bring disadvantages than advantages that we imagine because customer prioritization is not done in practice. And it will cost less if it was planning according to the common inventory pool without customer prior, uh, prioritization. So by using extra information and by developing more complex policies, we increase the system cost while we are, we are, uh, while we are trying to reduce it. Mm -hmm. so that part is interesting from my perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my comment. Yeah, thank you, Under Hocam. You are right uh, from the perspective of cost, uh, but uh, there are also uh, agreements uh, putting mm. those constraints actually. So uh, you promise some customers, high priority customers, uh, like three hours downtime on the average uh, for the whole uh, month or something uh, per part, I guess. Or I don't exactly know those terms. We don't uh, include any. Uh, service constraint here. We just put back order cost. Uh, so we, there are some agreements like, okay, for some we uh, agreed, for some customer we agreed three hours, for some customers 30 hours. These are already on the, in the contracts. But mm. when it comes to uh, reallocating decisions, uh, and in reallocation it's not a problem, but uh, when uh, fulfilling a demand, maybe waiting for the uh, pipeline stock would in what this uh, service contract requires uh, in, a, in a fair way, because otherwise we would treat the, the two customers the same while asking for more money or the customer companies are asking more money for the customer with three hours uh, short uh, uh, deadline. So basically, yes, we might be increasing uh, costs, but uh, there is also the uh, service in, uh, uh, constraints service level constraints that impose. So it's kind of back order. Downtime costs are uh, different per customer. And if we include downtime costs, it might be still reasonable to do uh, customer differentiation to reduce this downtime. So in that sense, 
uh, if we only consider as a cost perspective, uh, inventory holding costs, I fully agree. We are losing many um, uh, customer pooling options. However, uh, the customer has different penalties for that. Uh, that's 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 why I think it's still uh, your algorithms are uh, useful. And yeah, I am right, right? You are working on uh, customer differentiation. Yeah, yeah. The, the as far as not nowadays, but yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, in the future, uh, I, I can continue on the on that stream. Yeah, dynamic policies are. Uh, uh, sorry, Oktay Hocam, just as just a sentence. It was a just just a follow up uh, comment. So Hocam, so. So as far as I remember, uh, they also they are also using different kinds of uh, measures in those kind of agreements. Uh, so it is not a fix or it is not a given or single measure that they are that they are using uh, for customer levels or for customer satisfaction. That also makes it really difficult to implement this kind of customer segmentation or uh, discrimination policy. Yeah. Let's say. Yeah. As far as I remember, that yeah. was the case. Oktay, Oktay Hocam is right. There are specific hours mentioned in the service contracts, but it doesn't say anything in the uh, customer regime, which should say, actually, because if your uh, penalties are different and constraints are different, penalties, Lagrangian multiplier thing, uh, is different, and therefore this should uh, it should be treated differently. So in that sense, Önder Hocam, your methods or algorithms are very much uh, interesting here in this field. And uh, so basically, it's not that much of uh, use in the practice yet, but I think it should be because, as Oktay Hocam mentioned, there are service contracts. Service contracts says these uh, hours, say that it's okay for three weeks, sorry, three uh, months. This is the total downtime that we promise to the customer. And when you have, once you have that, then you should keep track of that and try to meet this. And if you are very uh, easy to reach that level, you can just uh, take a downtime by ignoring uh, that order for a while uh, to compensate it with a, uh, you are short of with a, another service constraint for another customer. And that's not being done. Yeah, uh, I see. The, what I am trying to say is more or less the following. Okay, dynamic policies are valuable in order to get the global mm -hmm. optimum, let's say, because they are time dependent policies. Mm -hmm. uh, when we compare their performances with static ones, okay, they are better. But we, sh in order to benefit from these policies in real life, we should guarantee an environment to apply these policies because th that kind of policy, such a policy, mm -hmm. would dictate us do this at this time point and change your decision yeah. at this time point. Okay, they are dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, by nature, so it is important to have the agreements beforehand. Exactly. The, the uh, for example, uh, the, the to have an information system mm -hmm. that yeah. that will uh, feed such kind of policies, so on and so forth. So they they have some requirements. Okay, as a research area, it's very good to mm -hmm. work on these, but they have some requirements yes. to be, yes. to be satisfied yes. beforehand. Yes, yes, I, I fully agree. So uh, although we need smartness, smart solutions, uh, the, the tactical plans and all those things do not incorporate that and just ignore while they are being ignored, there's no meaning to put it at the operation level. But I think this should change if we need flexible solutions at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think we need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you too. Okay, great. Um, are there any other questions? Maybe a comment uh, so about this flexible solution. So mm -hmm. therefore, they are, they are really willing to use these three printing components, as far as I remember, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it creates also an, a different and interesting problem because uh, so on one hand, you will have a quick solution for your spare parts problem. So it is easy, it is cheap to produce but they are not as durable as the, the normal components. But on the other hand, you can bring some uh, normal uh, components. They are durable, but they are also expensive. So this is also kind of a dual sourcing problem. So as far as I remember, this is also a kind of a popular problem in this maintenance or spare part inventory uh, literature. Am I right, Hoja? Definitely, definitely. I, I, I'm 
uh, I, I don't work on dual sourcing, uh, though I'm working on lost sales, still a little bit related to that. Emergency shipment is dual, actually. We see many dual sources here, right? So, but I still don't consider myself as working on dual sources, but you are very right. There is all uh, already a paper, actually. Uh, yeah, Rob, 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 Rob and Bram should, as far yeah. as I remember, Rob and Bram has a paper on, yeah, a paper exactly. on that, that subject. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I don't remember the names of the people, but uh, maybe Sheng and Song, uh, maybe Song, uh, Jeanette Song, maybe, also has a paper on that. And uh, this is a similar problem on 3D printing. So it's not only going at, uh, let's say, Netherlands, around Netherlands, but uh, there is also interest at, uh, in, in, in US on that same same subject. And I think a little bit influenced by the uh, research going on uh, Netherlands. And yes, you are right. Uh, they consider this uh, as a dual sourcing problem and they work on dual sourcing policies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A nice paper and uh, those two papers that you at least the per paper that you mentioned and also the other paper that I raised. And if you are interested, I can send those papers. Uh, yeah, why not, Ojan? Uh, it would be great for me. Yeah, yeah I, I like those two papers, actually. They are very nice ones on dual sourcing. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Ojan. And um, if there are no other uh, comments or questions, um, I think we're going to close this uh, seminar uh, for today. Once again, Engin Topan Ojam, thank you very much for your uh, uh, time and effort and you know, for the presentation.